So, John asked me to uh, make a video showing how to do PEG. And I said, John, nothing has changed in four decades. We've been doing PEG. But there may be some points to teach. But I went, I went to make a new video, and then I realized that only one thing in my video had changed. And that was me. <laughs> So I'll let you see that change. However, the rest of it is the same, and I want to point out the different parts. We'll show the whole video, although it will be in the Sigma uh, uh, format for your perusal later. Uh, so little tricks. Let's go ahead with the video. I have no disclosures, unfortunately. So this is me talking about this patient. Any changes in me? I had longer hair and a thinner face. But the uh, patient that we're going to describe here is an elderly patient who's had previous abdominal surgery and has a, actually an ileostomy in place in the midline. So the fact that the patient's had previous abdominal surgery uh, does not preclude this. Uh, after a gastric bypass, however, you can't do a peg into the uh, stomach. Not directly. So you see this patient, and the patient you see here is getting conscious sedation. Sometimes now patients get propofol, but it is important if you're doing it for decompression uh, to make sure that the stomach is empty before you begin. Uh, here, my assistant is using a betadine preparation uh, to prepare the abdomen. Most of the kits come with a, a, uh, a different kind of prep now, and uh, we, we don't always use... Uh, uh, betadine, but betadine is perfectly fine. Uh, so we drape the abdomen. Uh, this is a two-person technique. We can do it with one person. I think it's much safer to do it with two people. I think that the most skill is required at the abdominal area rather than uh, in the uh, endoscopic portion. We put five things up on the belly, uh, the uh, local needle and uh, some uh, xylocaine, uh, the suture that we're going to pass, uh, four by four. And so here we are going down with the scope, and it's worth taking a while to inspect the stomach before you try to do anything. And people have pointed out it's not worth it. I don't like to put a lot of air in the GI tract, but I do like to go in the duodenal bulb at least, make sure there isn't an ulcer. I think Brian Duncan years ago did a study to show that when you look in the duodenal bulb, about a third of the patients may have some disease there. So if they have an ulcer, you'd like to know it, you'd like to treat it, but I don't believe in uh, doing a prolonged examination here. Uh, we get in the duodenum, make sure the bulb is okay. Often uh, don't go much farther than that. And there you see the duodenal bulb, it looks just fine. Now is the most important part of the case is to find the right site. And transillumination was what we used to write about. I like this finger pressure technique. And my assistant here is pushing, and we don't see any clear indentation right away. And so you say, wait a minute. Why don't we see this? Let's take a little bit more time. You come a little bit more proximal. I like to tell the assistant, go up subxiphoid. Start immediately subxiphoid and work your way down the left costal margin if you don't see indentation. And then suddenly, you'll start to see indentation. You can make that indentation better. You keep working there. Now you start to see a direct, easy indentation. And at that point, we put in a little local. Well, what we're going to do now is what's called the safe tract method. And the safe tract method is keeps you out of trouble. What we're going to do is take that needle and go perpendicular as we go into very slow and we aspirate looking for air. We should see air appear at the same time as the needle appears in the stomach. If the needle gets air in it, if the syringe gets air in it before you get in this, before you see it in the stomach, you're in the wrong place. Take the needle out and pick another spot. So here we are. We're going to pass that needle in. And uh, I have the snare waiting to catch it. It's a very simple technique. You thrust the needle in. There it is. We put it there with the snare waiting. And we just catch it right like that. If you don't catch it, catch it again. So there you go. You tighten the snare and you take out the stylet. And then you put in the loop suture. As simple as this is, you follow the technique or you get in trouble. And so here we are. Now once the suture is well into the stomach, we loosen the snare, grab the suture, tighten it, 
and we, we don't try to pull it up into the channel. You just pull it out and leave the snare in the scope. I'll show you why. Uh, this makes the second passage of the scope much easier. So now we take the tube, which hasn't changed in all these years. We pass the suture that's coming out of the mouth. This was designed for gastroenterologists so they wouldn't have to tie a knot. We put it over the head of the catheter, and now we have a square knot attaching the end of the tube to the suture coming through the mouth. Now, what we'll do is take the, the snare that's coming through the scope and pass it around half the head of the, of the tube, just half the head, and tighten it up real tight and pull it up against the scope. And now, the assistant at the abdomen starts to pull the tube out the abdominal wall. You'll see that the tube will emerge from the abdominal wall before it even enters the mouth. Watch. It'll come out of the abdominal wall, and now you work together. The assistant pulls while you push, and once you get about 30 centimeters into the esophagus, I say 30 centimeters, mid-esophagus, everybody stops, you loosen the snare, and the assistant pulls out the tube from the snare, and that makes the second passage of the scope much easier than trying to re-intubate. You follow the tube down, and you make sure it's sitting against the uh, gastric wall, and essentially, the endoscopic part of this is done. You don't even have to suction the stomach because when you open up this tube, you're going to decompress it. Paying attention to this part of the case is important because too much tension on this tube can cause it to extrude early and uh, cause a problem. So we cut the tube about a foot long. Some of the tubes are marked, many aren't, but I make, don't make it too short, about a foot long. Then you take the crossbar, and there's various types, but it doesn't matter which one you use. You take the crossbar and you grab the tip. Now here, my assistant will help me pull it down. You really don't need his assistance. You can uh, do it by yourself. You grab the end, and here he's pulling with me. You don't need him to pull with you. If one per you just hold the tube in one hand and you pull with the other, and you put it down. Now you don't want it too tight. You want it to be with a little tension on the tube about a centimeter, about a half a centimeter uh, from the uh, skin, and I'll show you that. It should, when you lay the tube down, there should be three or four millimeters of tube visible between the crossbar and the skin. If there is not, it's under too much tension, and you'll, you'll eventually erode the tube out. So make sure it's loose at the skin. At this point, we just put, we clean up the abdomen, uh, the newer tubes come with a, uh, a clamp that the nurses love, so I encourage you to use that. And then we put this on. I use it right away. I used to wait 24 hours, and the video says 24 hours. I generally feed the patient right away uh, and use the PEG tube unless there's some other reason not to. Uh, this procedure is simple. We've modified it so that you can put a jejunal extension tube in. We've done it directly into the jejunum at times for a direct jejunostomy, and we've even done it into the cecum for a percutaneous cecostomy. This is a simple procedure. Uh, just follow the rules, uh, and uh, it's, it's not too hard to do. Thank you very much.